Thank you everybody and it's great to see such a big crowd and I'd like to thank I'd like to thank Richard for organising it and um, and whoever else organised it tonight. Lots of other people. Lots of other people because UKIP is nothing without its branches and its activists, which I say every time I'm on a platform anywhere. It's not about the people at the top. They are the instruments of the people in the middle and at the bottom. And without them, we'd be nothing. Now, I think there's quite a big crowd here tonight. It's fantastic. How many of you are UKIP members? And most of you, some of plenty, you plenty are not. So. I'm sorry? Speak up. Speak up. Okay, I'll shout. I thought I was mic'd up. There we go. Right. Now, you all know what happened on the 17th of February. When Henry Bolton got the job back in September last year, I said, Henry, you realise that you've got the most difficult job in British politics. I didn't realise that six months later I've had it. I would have it. <laughs> And he would have made it infinitely more difficult. But he has, and that's where we are. Now, I'd like to say a bit about UKIP, where, what's happened in the last uh, four weeks, uh, since so many of you are UKIP members. Um, basically, I inherited nothing. Not entirely true. I inherited a financial crisis, and I inherited the people down at Lexstrom House in um, Devon. And we, people have been made redundant, as you know, they're down to eight people down there. And without those people doing the fantastic job that they do, we wouldn't have any structure in the party at all. This is how we're able to go on functioning and talking to our branches uh, and our members and our access, because those people are there. I went straight down there to find out what the situation was uh, with the treasurer and I found out that we were about to go into the red and, and uh, if something wasn't done urgently we would have been insolvent. Um, the first thing I did actually, it's not entirely true that the first thing I did was try to raise money, the first thing I did was to get rid of Lenny the Lion. Yeah. Why on earth would you change a brand that's been built up over 20 years so that in the local elections People would go in there and not actually able, be able to find your logo on the ballot paper. It was insanity. I took that executive decision, which everyone knew I was going to do anyway, and got rid of Lenny. Then I got down to serious business of trying to raise money. Now, I, as you'll be well aware, because you probably had the letter uh, very recently, I organised a fundraising letter to all the members. We wrote to 20 odd thousand members asking them to make a donation. Uh, unfortunately, it was delayed going out, and the last of the letters didn't actually go out until very recently. But I can tell you now, um, as Ernie has already said, we have now moved into the black. I got that today from the Red. So that's some good news. I also wrote to 20 odd thousand ex members, inviting them to come back, and I don't actually know what the figures are for that yet to tell you how many have come back, but I do hope a large percentage of them do come back because and also I have a, a, a other um, membership recruiting campaigns which I'm trying to uh, initiate. If we had a part, if in our heyday we had 40,000 members, which wasn't that long ago, it was only two years ago. If we had that now, we would have an income of 1.2 million and we could run a very respectable party on that. There are lots of things I'd like to do, which I just don't have the money to do. We need a communications director, I need a full-time press officer. There are one or two other things to do with communications that we urgently need. In fact, I've done a, I didn't do it, I've got somebody to do it for me, a communications audit so that we can see what's wrong with our internal and our external communications and how we fix it. And that will be the next thing that I'm embarking on and trying to do that at the minimum cost. But we need to be able to talk to each other we need to be able to talk uh, to the rest of the world. And of course, as uh, Ernie has kindly pointed out, um, I asked um, Tony McIntyre to be chairman, which he kindly accepted. I'm not sure he actually knew what he was letting himself in for, so I'm glad I didn't warn him before. <laughs> but he's doing a fantastic job. And as, as Ernie rightly says, he's a volunteer. He's not getting anything for it, except a lot of extra activity. Uh, in the days and in the evenings and at the weekends. 
Uh, but he's going to stick with me during this interim period and we'll see where we go after that. And of course Sebastian Fairweather joined last week. He's been down to Letstrom House um, and he is now uh, changing things in a positive way and is able to deliver that verdict today that we've now gone into the black. You will be aware from the press yesterday that I had another little problem land on my desk yesterday morning which I knew was coming. I wasn't quite sure when it was going to come or how bad it was going to be but we have a legal bill for £175,000. But, I can't tell you what it is, but we have a plan, and the people who are helping me with that plan tell me not to worry, because they know I'm a bit of a worrier sometimes. I always feel, I'm a pessimist by nature because I always feel that it saves unnecessary disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> but, I am told not to worry, to go away and talk at the meeting tonight, to have a lovely time, and everything's going to be all right. And I trust them, because I know what part of that plan is, and I think we're going to raise that money. UKIP is not going to go under. <laughs> Without UKIP, there would be no opposition. And the reason that I stood up into this job, I stood up for one reason, not because uh, I have much of an ego, I don't really, um, I had no desire to be famous, I had no desire to tell people what to do, particularly. But I was not prepared to see UKIP come to an end. In the party, in the audience here tonight, you've got one of the other founder members, Hugh Mulwin Hughes. And we sat in a room uh, 25 years ago, and we formed the party on the basis that it would be a force in national politics. And that it would represent ordinary working people and small business people. I think you were, <laughs> you will remember that very well, well, on the basis of why we formed that party. His job isn't done. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me say something about what's actually happening on Brexit, because uh, yesterday most of my time went on thinking about other things, but I was aware of what was coming along in the pipeline. And, of course, I've, I've had a bit of time to read it. Now, the referendum was almost two years ago. And three and a half years ago, I published this little book in which I said, what would happen if there was a referendum? Because it was only a promise then, remember, if there was a referendum and if we won. And what I said is there would be a relentless campaign of trench warfare, a war of attrition, by the establishment, by the Remainers, to stop it happening. And I think that you will agree that I was probably right. And I think what part of the problem was is that a lot of people who voted for us and some of the people who were in our party thought on the 23rd of June 2016 that the job was done. Well, they couldn't have been farther from the truth. What have we actually seen? Almost two years and almost nothing happened. It, it took Mrs May until last March, I think, wasn't it, before she actually triggered Article 50. Yeah. Then she didn't make a speech till the end of the year, and then there was another speech in January. Um, and now, finally, they've got around to negotiating something. And what have they achieved in this great negotiation? Well, I can tell you what it is. It's a betrayal of what Brexit was meant to mean. And in case we forget what it means, it means exit. Brexit means exit. It means leaving the European Union. It doesn't mean to be tied to the Union, to be half in and half out. It means leaving. Now, what they actually agreed yesterday isn't the withdrawal agreement. It is, um, I don't know, what did they actually call it? I can't quite remember. A legal text. Uh, which constitutes a decisive step. <laughs> and I think they're probably right in that. It does constitute a decisive step, but it's a step in the wrong direction, which is uh, not actually leaving very quickly, if at all. Now, the, this, this document is the, the uh, Commission's draft withdrawal agreement, and the final draft agreement has yet to be drawn up and has yet to be voted on by the European Parliament. What we had yesterday, of course, is that we're told we're going to leave by 2019, the end of March, but there's now going to be a transition period which will go on 
till 2022. We'll end up paying money till 2020, I believe. Uh, we're going to be bound by the laws of the European Court of Justice. Sorry, we're going to be bound by the EU's laws, the, new one, the old ones that are there and the new ones that will come in, and those laws will be interpreted by the European Court of Justice. Uh, we're still going to have the common fisheries policy, at least up until 2020, uh, and with our British fishermen and our industry, which has been so disgracefully betrayed over the years, will still only be allowed to catch the fish that they can catch now, which I believe is only 13% of the total in what used to be British waters. And in fact, years ago, when I was trying to write a pamphlet on how much does the EU cost Britain, I got in contact with the uh, Maritime Authority, whatever it was at the time, uh, and asked them how many fish were caught uh, in British territorial waters. And they said, I can't, we can't tell you because there are no British territorial waters, there are only EU waters. So I had to try and work it out backwards to come up with a figure uh, of how much we actually were sacrificed uh, in order to be members of this wonderful union. So we're going to be stuck with that, and we're going to be stuck with open borders at least up until 2020. Uh, that means we will have had uh, four years of open borders when everybody knows we're supposed to be leaving. So what are they going to do? They're going to get in under the wire. And of course, under this arrangement, they will also have full rights to everything that a British citizen has rights to. Benefits, housing, education, NHS, etc. Oh, and I thought you'd also like to know that we've agreed to continue paying the pensions and the health insurance of EU bureaucrats um, forever, basically, until they're all dead, which could be a very long time, are the ones that we're currently committed to, or will be committed to, up until 2020. And, of course, this transition period is going to go on, we're told, till 2022, so we'll be saddled with this. Now, one of the things I spoke about in the book was the fact that they would delay it up until the next general election. Because at the general election, this whole thing could be overturned. Now, uh, it might surprise you to know that me and Jeremy Corbyn had something in common. Because up until fairly recently, we were both, at the core of our political beliefs, was opposition to the EU, and we were committed to leaving. It's about the only thing we did have in common. But it was something that we did have for all those years, 40 odd years, uh, since I've been thinking about this and since he's been thinking about it. And of course now he seems to have changed his mind. So what's to stop the establishment in the form of the Tories and in the form of Labour actually reneging on that promise to leave the European Union after the next general election? Well, the referendum had no force in law. It could have had that in the Act of Parliament that was uh, passed, but it didn't. And of course, it has more democratic legitimacy than any government you can think of since the end of the Second War. Of war. I'm not sure that any government since the end of the Second War has had more than 52% of the vote. Did they? Some, some scholar in the audience will tell me if they did, but probably not. It had more force than any government we've had in decades. And if you remember why Parliament was constituted in the first place, and the first one back in 1265, that represented not just the Lords but the Commons, and it was called a Common Council of the Realm. It was meant to be the opinion, at least those who uh, were allowed to have an opinion, I'm not pretending it was a democracy because it wasn't, but it was to ask the opinion of the general population. It was a Common Council of the Realm. And that is what the referendum was. A Common Council of the Realm. It wasn't something that could be decided by a group of any MPs. It was something that the general population of the country were asked their opinion, and they gave it. And they gave it in the face of a relentless campaign by the media and the establishment to tell them not to do it. Project Fear. All the nonsense. And they talk about our side lying. I don't think anybody on our side lied. There may be one or two facts and figures that were a bit wrong, but nobody lied. But we were told a relentless campaign of lying. How much was it? Did the Chancellor say it was going to cost every family four thousand pounds, something like that? I think Mr. Cameron even intimated that there might be a third world war yeah. if we voted to leave. 
Oh, exactly. There you are. Of course, there's another one. I'm sure we could come up. We could have a competition and see who can guess the the best one from the campaign. And of course, we know it was all nonsense. But I know people who said to me, "Well, you know, I, I don't like the EU, but I'm a bit frightened of leaving because we won't be out of trade, will we? You know, <laughs> businesses will go bust, jobs will be lost." And people who don't spend their lives like us reading all of this stuff, they have much better things to do, but we have to do it. Uh, and we read all this stuff, and we know it was nonsense. But a lot of voters out there didn't know it was nonsense. And a lot of them voted, I believe, to remain, not because they actually liked the EU, but because they were actually fearful. And what's happened in that two, almost two years since, they've seen that it was a campaign of lies. They've seen that there's nothing to be frightened of. I don't want the second referendum because it isn't necessary, but I do believe if there was one, we'd actually get a much bigger majority than we got last time. Now, I explained, I explained um, what's going on and how we've got where we are. Let me give you a, a, little, a brief exposition on what we should have started doing on the 24th of June 2016 and what is not too late to be done. If you really wanted to leave, if we had a patriotic Prime Minister in office the day after the referendum, let me tell you what they would have done. They would have immediately enacted a bill to repeal the 1972 European Community Act. <laughs> and you don't have to take my word for it because who drafted such a bill? but Bill Cash MP. It was a brilliant bill. In fact, I used it as Appendix 1 in the UKIP EU exit plan, Brexit must mean exit, to show exactly how it would be done. You take us out of the EU under our law, which is perfectly permissible under our constitution, our law, and indeed international law. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. You leave unilaterally. But what you do then is leave all of the legislation in place. So you go to the EU the next day and you say, actually we left, but nothing changes, all the law is there, still there. But what we're going to start doing now, if you had a patriotic parliament of course, is we're going to start repealing and amending that legislation in our time scale and according to our priorities. Because we don't want to have chaos, we don't want to have things not working, so we're going to tell you how it's going to work. We're not going to ask you, we're going to tell you. And we are going to do that in a spirit of friendship and cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. And the first thing you would do is to say, continue tariff-free trade. Would you like it? Why not? It benefits both of us. So I'll tell you what, we'll give you a week to think about it, and we'll come back, or you can send us a text. If you don't want it, we'll have World Trade Organization terms, which actually would more impact more on your businesses than it would on ours because you sell us far more than we sell you. Exactly. The French farmers will be going to Mr. Macron saying you can't possibly do this. We won't sell them all the champagne that we sell. They might go and buy busy wine from South Africa or New Zealand. And the German car makers would say you can't do this because we sell them loads of cars. So it would take some nerve and courage and above all patriotism. And the last one is what we're lacking in our political yeah. And when you've done that, you would say, now we're going to sort out the borders. So the people already here, yeah, okay, they can have their continued rights. Our citizens in the EU, they can continue with theirs. And in fact, the EU can't guarantee them anyway. They can't enforce their law across the other 27 member states. So what we'll do is we'll do an a, 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 a agreement with each individual country saying, your people are okay here, okay here, if ours are okay there. And where you've got about 900,000 Polish people in the UK and an equivalent of about 30,000 British people in Poland, I don't think they'd have a problem with agreeing that. And then what you'd end up with is you say, we're going to introduce a system like we've got with the rest of the world, where certain countries have visa-free access because we don't have lots of people trying to migrate because there's economies of similar size, so there isn't a big problem and other countries where they have lots of very poor people who want to come to the UK, very understandably, we're going to have visas for those, and we're going to introduce a points-based job, uh, you know, a, a job permit system, because we don't actually want to stop people coming, but we do want to control it and say who can come and who can't come. Yeah. And 
then what you do, for all the rest of the stuff, you prioritise it. Say, this is how we can deal with it. And when you get to things like the uniform height of brake lights on farm vehicles, we'll say, I'll tell you what, that directive can go in the back of the queue. We'll look at that in five years or ten years. It's not very, very important. And that's how you would do it. And the big problem, as you are well aware, is we don't have anybody with the guts and the courage and the foresight to actually do it. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. So what do you do about that situation? You must make UKIP an electoral threat once again. Now, that's very difficult under our first-past-the-post system, as we all know, because we've been at it for 20 five years, almost, well, 26 years uh, from the days uh, when we were called the Anti-Federalist League, and you try going out and campaigning under that name. <laughs> well, we used to, Q used to, and me. Under the first pass of post system, it's difficult. But we got this referendum without winning lots of seats in Parliament, didn't we? I think we can win seats. And I think that we need to buckle down and start again. We know that we won seats, 350 seats, I think, didn't we, in past local elections. And one of the things I didn't inherit on the 17th of February was a local election campaign. Yeah. Something that should have been organised six months ago yeah. didn't exist. Yeah. So I've come in with no candidates, no plan, no leaflet, nothing. And I've had to try to get that up and working. We are trying to recruit candidates now. So if you would be a candidate, even if you are going to be a paper candidate, please step forward. And this is the message that's going all around in the country now. We only have about 10 days a week to actually start registering candidates. I've done a draft leaflet. We have got a template where you can get that leaflet downloaded from the printer. You can put your details in and you can go with a leaflet, our leaflet, or you can do your own leaflet. Or if you're a paper candidate and you don't want a leaflet, you don't have to have one. If we go into this election with 100 candidates and get slaughtered, it doesn't look very good. If we go into this election with more than 740 candidates and we get a TV broadcast and we get slaughtered, we can say it doesn't matter because we're back on the field, we're back in the fight, and wait till the next fight because it's going to be even better. That's what we need to do. I can't make you any promises about the local election because we're, as I said, we're from a standing start with nothing. But let's see what we can do. If, it, if all it's going to take you is going out and get 10 signatures uh, on a piece of paper and then you don't do anything, do that. If you want to write, deliver a leaflet and you can deliver 5,000 leaflets in a ward with you and a friend or a couple of friends, do that. But please do whatever you can to put us back on the map for this particular fight, which is perhaps going to be one of the most difficult we've ever done. Because when I will get interviewed on the TV and they try to mock me and mock you kid over what's happened, I want to be able to say, we got people out, we fought, we're coming back, we're going to fight, and all the traitors and the Remainers and the Quislings are going to have to look out once again. Great, wasn't it? Because we've all been concerned, you know, I think it's great leadership, passion, and we can all unite behind Gerard and fight the local elections, make sure Brexit happens, and make sure what we fought for in the past happens. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah.